our salty and spicy text ends. Let us consider how we'll apply these words to our lives this morning, friends. Ah, what do we do with a text like this, particularly in a sermon series on balance? Uh Uh-huh. This is, in fact, our last sermon of this sermon series on balance, all about our mission out in the world. It's about once you have found balance in your life, how do you then take that out into the world and go on mission in the world and do something good for other people now that you have balance in your life? And our lectionary text brought us to this. Right here. I want you to consider for a moment what it means to make someone stumble. What it means to get in the way of someone else. To get in the way of their life. To trip them up. Particularly when we're talking about the smallest among us. Now as we watch Hannah up here with the microphone in hand, right? Not a single one of us wants to be a stumbling block to Hannah, do we? No. Not at all. And yet, I would posit that so often our adult culture in our communities, in the world, in our politics, in religion, in so many different places, we are that very stumbling block for children all over the planet. We are the ones who get in the way. We are the ones that cause them to lose faith. We are the ones that cause them to go... To hell with it. Right? We're the ones who get in their way. And so Jesus, in the midst of all of this journey, they're going to Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee, which is a major fishing area. And those of you who are familiar with any stories of Jesus know that there's a lot of fishing stories, aren't there? Right? Because that's what life was all about there. It was a fishing culture, both personally and commercially. And all the things that are mentioned here in this text go along with that same fishing culture, okay? When you go back to the feeding of the 5,000, there were two pieces of food present, right? Bread, loaves, right? And fish, right? Because what they would do is they would mill the flour. They would mill the wheat in the flour, right, with these mill stones that are here in this text. And it says in our text, it was a great millstone, okay? And they use that because we don't actually understand the terminology here, but what the actual Greek here is, it's a giant donkey millstone because there were different sizes of millstones. And they'd literally attach donkeys to these millstones, Right, And the donkey would turn the millstone and it would grind up this wheat and turn it into a flour-based substance that they would then use to make bread. And so when we come to a story that's common like feeding of the 5,000 and there's bread and fish there, for us that's just part of the story that came down. But for them that was all of life. That was the food that was present. Bread. And fish. And what does Jesus say to do with that millstone? They put it around your neck and they cast you into the sea. Right? Once again, all part of this fishing culture, the sea was literally right there. Right? When he is saying this, he's going, and we should throw you right over there. Right? Right out of the boat. Right? And then he uses this term hell, which for us theologically I mean, how many of you have, uh, have some issues with hell? Anybody have any issues with hell? Uh-huh, right? Anyone feel like they're going there? Anyone feel like they already are there? Uh-huh. And we laugh and we joke, but internally many of us feel the weight of that, don't we? And what does Jesus do with all of this terminology? So hell here is this Greek word Gehenna. Gehenna was this garbage dump just south of Jerusalem. It was in the Hinnom Valley, okay, and that's the Henna of Gehenna, the Hinnom Valley. And literally it was this giant garbage dump for the urban center that had become Jerusalem. 
And so everyone took all of their trash to the valley of Hinnom, and it was literally on fire. Okay, and the smoke literally filled the entire valley, and it would never end. It would never stop. And so Jesus goes, it would be better for you to go through the fires of the great valley of Hinnom, which we translate hell, than to be a stumbling block for one of these. And then Jesus goes even further, right, and goes, it'd be better for you to tear off an arm, a foot, to literally gouge your own eyeball out so that you enter the kingdom of heaven with just one eye, one arm, and one leg, right? Which, once again, theologically for us doesn't exactly line up, right? We believe we die, and then we get these glorious heavenly bodies, right? That are full and whole and beautiful and spiritual and not missing an eye, not missing a leg, not missing an arm, right? So I want you to understand when Jesus is using all of this terminology, he is clearly in first century Jewish and Roman theology and using it to teach lessons right here, okay? I don't want you to come away today and go, Justin said that if you lose a limb here on the earth, when you get to heaven, you are limbless, right? Because Jesus, like any good teacher or preacher, uses the context of where he's at, He's talking to people with beliefs already, with ideas already, with politics already, with economic viewpoints already, right? He's using the stuff of culture, millstones and the sea and fish, the great valley of Hinnom on fire, and their beliefs that you could enter the kingdom of heaven missing most of your body, right? He's utilizing all of it to make a point. Don't get in the way of someone else, particularly the least among us, particularly the smallest among us, particularly those who have no power, who have no influence, who have, particularly in the first century, who have no use to you. Don't get in their way. Do not get in their way. We have this phrase, do no harm, right? Anyone in, from the medical community? One. It's usually a lot more than that, right? Two-ish. Two, she went ish. Yeah, you count, okay? Do no harm. It's the first rule, isn't it? Right? It is the main directive. Do no harm. Within the United Methodist tradition, John Wesley, one of his greatest pieces of ethics that he handed down through the Protestant Revolution was that phrase. Do no harm. Imagine if you and I walked out into the world this week and that was our value that drove our mission in the world, do no harm. Don't be a stumbling block. Don't be that wall for someone else. Don't be that barrier. Don't be that thing that trips them up. Don't be that person who messes it up for them. Don't be the kind of human being that makes another person lose faith, lose hope. To lose innocence, to lose a sense of meaning and purpose in the world. Don't be that kind of human being. Instead, be salt. Be salt. You see how that text ends with this whole thing about salt? For everyone will be salted with fire. Anyone ever been salted with fire? You probably don't use that phrase, right? We don't, well, that's not a part of our English idiom right there. Anyone gone through some pain and suffering in their lives? Mm hmm. Yeah, that's what that phrase is referencing, friends. 
that you and I go through the trials of life and we have a choice with it. We can be the kind of people who go through those trials and difficulties and we become the cynical, skeptical, mean, harsh people from those circumstances that become those stumbling blocks for others. Or, or we become seasoning for all of life. We become the preservation for other folks. We become what salt is used for in this world. To season, to make flavor, right? To make meaning, right? Anyone have any unsalted mashed potatoes ever in their life? <laughs> right? They are pointless, literally. But you add a little butter and salt, and all of a sudden something magical happens with them. Okay? They become, I mean, for me, I mean, there's just nothing better than a great mashed potato, right? I'm just like, oh, yeah, right? Give me the whole bowl. But just the right amount of salt and the right amount of butter, everything becomes beautiful and wonderful with it. But without it, life's terrible. Literally, it's a gooey, ooey mess, isn't it? It's clumpy and all the things that go along with it, right? You're just like, that's not the life I want. The churning of the potato, the churning of our lives can produce something that's completely meaningless or if we keep our saltiness, our seasoning, our sense of being, our sense of purpose, our sense of mission in the world, the reason why you and I are here, then all of a sudden something beautiful happens. Salt seasons. Salt preserves. So what kind of person will we be? Can we at least go out in the world this week and do no harm? Not be those stumbling blocks. And at our best, what if we are the great seasoning for people's lives? What if in our own fire by salt, right, trials by fire, you and I don't become harsh and cynical and skeptical and mean and divisive and judgmental, but instead we're the very people who come alongside of these little ones like Hannah and season her life and make it meaningful. And rather getting in the way, we become the very avenue so that her life becomes full and flavorful. Amen.